Now we've got the basics uh, of sorted out of the Hubble graph. Uh, we can get onto the real cutting edge parts of physics, uh, astrophysics. We can start to look at things that we don't really understand properly and hopefully you'll understand from this that there's a lot of current research going on uh, which is trying to answer questions which have only really been asked in the last few years and people are still working hard to get the data to try to decide what the correct theories are. So we're on the dark side of astrophysics. This is stuff that uh, is quite mysterious in places. We're going to talk about the possible outcomes for the universe. It's all going to end badly somehow or other but we're going to try and work out possibly what will happen to us, um, describe the evidence that we've got for the model that we've got at the moment, and then we need to talk about dark energy and dark matter. So we need to go back a little bit first of all before we can start. We used to think that the universe started with a big bang, well we still think that, and we, we think it's been expanding ever since. We've got lots of evidence we've talked about with redshift and the CMBR for that. But the harder question to answer is what's going to happen in the future. So some possibilities that I used to teach people about. The university might keep expanding forever. It might get bigger but tend towards a maximum size. Or it might contract back in something called a big crunch. Um, and this was a big question about uh, back in the 1990s, 1980s even. So the question is, well, how are we going to know which happens? And the obvious answer seemed to be, okay, to work out how fast the universe is expanding now and to work out how much mass there is um, and maybe, if we were very clever, to work out how fast the universe was expanding in the past. So, if you think about that, how fast is the universe expanding now? We've got a very accurate answer for the Hubble constant, which really tells us that. So the hard thing is to know how much mass there is, um, and that really is the crucial part of dark matter that we'll talk about. We can look at a graphical way of doing that. We can look at how fast the universe is expanding now. So we're on the size of the universe against time, this kind of the gradient of this graph really at this point. So we can we can work that out and that might give us a bit of a clue for which of these curves we're on. So if the universe is open, this means the radius of the universe is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger forever. If it's flat, that means um, it's going to increase to a maximum size, a bit like a kind of terminal velocity graph or something. It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and not quite ever stop expanding, but the rate of expansion is going to decrease. And then possibly, although it's getting bigger now, in the future, it might pull itself back together. Okay, well, we've got a pretty good idea of that. We've got our Hubble constant at 65 plus or minus 3. There's actually a much uh, more precise answer for that now. Um, how much mass is there, that's going to decide whether it gets pulled together or not. So when people started looking at this, they wanted to say, okay, if there's enough mass, it's like throwing something up in the air. If I know how fast it's going and I know how much mass the Earth's got, I know whether the Earth will pull it back or not. Okay. And when they started doing this, they took a fairly kind of simplistic approach, which is that we could look at the average mass of a star, we could count the number of stars in the galaxy, we could count the number of galaxies in the universe, we could multiply all those numbers together, and that might give us a reasonably good idea for the mass of the universe. That all seems like quite a good idea, but it misses one very important point, which is you're only looking at things you can see. Um, so scientists started to take another approach and they started to look for the rotation of galaxies because if they thought most of the mass of a galaxy is in the centre, the galaxy is rotating around the outside. If you could look at different distances from the centre, that would tell you about the mass of the central core and that would give you a good idea of the total mass of the galaxy. What they found out was that galaxies don't really rotate like that at all. They don't rotate as as if most of the mass is at the centre, they rotate as if the mass is fairly evenly distributed. So the stars certainly don't look like that. So this gave the, gave this idea that there's a lot of dark matter. Okay, hello, that's quite a good um, good name for it. It's matter, and it's dark in the sense of being a bit mysterious and unknown. Okay, it is kind of dark in the sense that you can't see it, but it's not thought to be things like black holes. Okay, it's a much more mysterious kind of matter, which must make up probably three quarters of all the mass of the universe. Okay, two um, main candidates for dark matter, hilariously named because we know physicists have got a great sense of humour. Uh, machos, machos is short for massive compact halo objects. So these are massive in the sense they've got mass, they're compact because they're small, 
and they're called halo objects because they go around the um, galaxy. They're not actually in the center of the galaxy, or at least they might be, but they're also all the way around the outside as well, fairly evenly distributed. And these are large, so things like brown dwarfs, neutron stars, black holes, okay, all the way around. We can look for these things um, by a technique called gravitational lensing because they're gravitational bend the light coming from behind them so if you see an object in one position it seems to move positions that'll be the gravitational lensing of something going in front of it um, and people think that those are about 90 percent of the milky way's mass in total so things that you couldn't find by just counting the stars but only about 20 percent of all dark matter so although these things exist they don't really explain why the um, Milky Way has got as much mass as it has, or indeed any other galaxy. We're just taking the Milky Way as being a fairly kind of typical galaxy. So when somebody had invented machos, we then end up with the opposite of machos, which is a wimp. These are our other candidates. These are weakly interactive massive particles. These again, are, these are called massive because they've got mass, but these are not big. These are particles which are not currently on our kind of um, standard model of particles. Okay. So a little bit like looking for neutrinos. Neutrinos are very hard to spot because they have so little interaction with matter. Okay, um, But we know they've got mass. There's loads and loads of neutrinos, but actually it works out that their total mass still isn't very significant. But what they're looking for is particles with much more mass than neutrinos, but are also very numerous. Okay, It's very hard to detect them, so there are some proposed ones, but nobody's proved what these are. Okay, but they must kind of pervade the galaxy because these are making up the other 80% of the dark matter. And remember, the dark matter is about 75% of the total mass. So most of the mass of the um, galaxy is actually made of these wimps, even though we can't detect them yet. We don't really quite know what they are. Okay, the third question is the really tricky one. Do we know how fast the universe was expanding in the past? Well, think about the Hubble graph, right? When we're looking back at the things that are a long, long way away, we're also looking a long way back in time. So although we've said so far the Hubble graph is a straight line, really it shouldn't be a straight line because the things that we're looking at in the past might not have been going at the same speed as they are now. So if we can look at things a long, long way away, we can estimate how fast they were traveling in the past, and then we can work out if the universe... Um, is expanding more quickly or less quickly than it was then. It's very hard to see things long, long way away. Okay, so we need something that can something very bright so we can spot it. What do we know that's very bright? Where well, we can measure the distance from our cosmic distance ladder, we might manage to work out that that's type one A supernovas. So this is why people are so obsessed with type one A supernovas and trying to spot them because they can tell us about the expansion of the universe over time. So if we think where those things would plot, on our graph we've got velocity against distance. Remember this is our standard Hubble graph. We've said it's a straight line. That's what we've expected so far, but we're looking right up here at the top end, the far distant parts of the universe. So if it plotted at this point, this means that if we look a long way away, which means a long way back in time, things are going at the same rate as now. They're still plotting along this straight line, which says their distance away from us is proportional to their velocity. So that would mean a constant rate of expansion. Okay, If they're plotted at B, then that means that their recession velocity a long time in the past was greater than it is now. Okay, That would tell us the rate of expansion of the universe was decreasing. If you remember back to our three curves before, they all had the rate of expansion decrease, and that seems to be the sensible possibility, doesn't it? If you throw something up in the air, it might slow down and come back. It might slow down but keep going. It might keep going and going and going. But the idea that you throw it up in the air and it speeds up is a bit ridiculous. So it's quite surprising when we get this answer at C, which says the rate of expansion of the universe is increasing. Things that we look at in the distance past were actually going slower than they would be if we were looking at them now. Okay. So this tells us that the expansion of the universe is increasing. The rate of expansion is increasing. This is very surprising. Okay, Gravity doesn't seem to imply that. Gravity would have to pull the universe back together again. So there's this idea um, 
that maybe this was wrong. A lot of scientists thought that can't be right, but they did lots of research. They tested their results. They had independent teams working on things. Everyone agreed that this was the correct answer. So eventually it was, expect it was uh, accepted science, and we came out with this idea of dark energy. So dark energy is very mysterious. Okay, It's some energy which is making the rate of expansion of the universe increase. The dark in here is no sense kind of the same as dark matter. It's dark in a kind of mysterious sense that nobody quite understood it. Um, and it's to, some people have talked about this idea of vacuum energy. So empty space can create energy. Um, if you remember back to unit one about particle pair production and the uncertainty principle, there's lots of very mysterious things about that which might kind of go to start explaining this. Um, but this is what's supposed to be increasing the rate of expansion of the universe, a kind of repulsive gravity idea. So here's our little diagram of the expansion of the universe. There is actually well accepted an, what they call an inflationary period here where the rate of expansion increases. Okay, What's going to happen in the future is actually the rate of expansion we think is going to get faster and faster and faster and the universe is basically going to get so far apart that even um, although clusters of galaxies will stay together, the galaxy clusters will actually get so far apart that you can never get between them. So eventually we're going to end up on our own little island of um, galaxies.